everyone, I'm Dr. Emily Drobek Monder, one of the astronomers here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. And today I'm here with Professor Jane Greaves from Cardiff University. And I'm going to be talking to Jane about this new study that came out recently about this weird and interesting gas that's been found in Venus's atmosphere. And actually, this gas may be produced by life in the atmosphere of Venus, which is really exciting stuff. Um, now, Jane is actually the principal investigator of that study, and I happen to be one of the co-authors on that work as well. So, welcome to the Royal Observatory, Jane. It's great to see you, Emily. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you as well. Um, so, first of all, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about the work, um, about what the work found, and also why the study is important? Okay, so we wanted to look for this molecule specifically called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And the reason is we realise that when you detect phosphine in the atmosphere, like a small rocky planet like the Earth, in the Earth's case it's mostly made by life and it's therefore a biosignature. And there's been this idea for oh, decades since the 1960s that although the surface of Venus is really unpleasant today, there is a kind of cool, wet, floating habitat that's possible in the cloud layers. So that's maybe 50 kilometres above the surface. And then I realised nobody had ever really looked, but we had ways to look for phosphine. So that's what the study aimed to do. Now, I think this study is really surprising in many ways. So when people tend to think about uh, life in the solar system, in extraterrestrial life, they tend to want to look at the planet Mars. Yeah. Um, and Venus has a lot harsher of an environment. Um, so on the surface of Venus, for example, um, we have very high temperatures, it's around 500 degrees Celsius, there's also high pressures, it could crush a human body, for example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, you also have these very acidic clouds made out of sulfuric acid. Um, so if we ever sent a person to the planet Venus, the question isn't would they die, but what would get them first, which is quite a scary thing. Um, so like you were saying, you're talking about, when you're talking about life um, on Venus, you're talking about life in the upper clouds. Um, so where it's a, a bit more hospitable. Yeah, we're definitely not talking about the surface where, like you say, the pressure is 90 times more than at the surface of the Earth. I don't think you could build like some kind of dome for humans there and expect any good things of it. Um, so the clouds are more hospitable in some senses, so the pressure is much more like it is at the surface of the Earth, and the temperature is, I don't know, 20 centigrade or something. It depends a bit how high up you are, but that all sounds nice. And then when you realise the clouds are mostly made of sulfuric acid and there's only a bit of water, um, then that's much more threatening. But I think um, people are so hopeful with this hypothesis that that hasn't been so much like thought through. Right, yeah. So um, how did you really think up this study? Why did you um, think up of phosphine and why did you want to kind of look for phosphine uh, at, on Venus, really? Um, well, I was going to ask to look for things at a future space telescope that um, may happen. The UK is a little bit involved in the design studies. I was thinking about what you could do for that with the solar system. So that's a telescope called Speaker, but it's at least still a dozen years off. Um, and kind of these things came together in my mind, my interest in life in the universe, um, what we could do with molecules um, with long wavelengths, even radio wavelengths, um, and this long-standing idea about the floating habitats in the clouds of Venus. It kind of all, like, three things came together in my mind, yeah. And I think uh, one of the, the interesting things for me was how you presented the project to me to get me on board. <laughs> I'm never going to let this down. <laughs> so um, so I, I, we were working together on, on several different things, actually. And one of the things I was interested in was how solar systems form, and so how stars form and how planets form. And we'd started working on um, looking for life on icy moons in our own yeah, solar system. Yeah. So uh, Jupiter and Saturn's moons. And I really remember that you walked into my office one day and said, would you like to study penguin poo in the <laughs> upper atmosphere of Venus? And what, you know, what do you say to that? You obviously say yes, absolutely. So can you explain a little bit more about penguin poo and how that relates to phosphine and, and Venus? I guess I was trying to, you know, you were interested in so many cool things that I was also interested in. I must have been trying to go, this is a highlight thing. So I had to read these funny papers and, uh, well, obviously like serious science papers, but to me they were funny. You get pictures of penguins and then you're like, 
a way of looking at how life is thriving in Antarctica is to look at phosphine gas because in penguins' guts, the bacteria that they have that produce this, where there's no oxygen inside somebody's gut, and then you get this kind of trail of penguin poop across Antarctica <laughs> so you can measure the gas. <laughs> so there are these serious scientific studies. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I was trying not to picture this flying penguin, but <laughs> it just came to mind. <laughs> so it's, it's a weird and interesting connection. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Two fields of study often come together, but not quite so uh, strangely as that, perhaps. <laughs> now, one thing that... So once you came up with the idea to look for phosphine gas in Venus's atmosphere, and then the team started kind of putting together a proposal to, to search for this gas in, in the atmosphere, um, one of the things was that we didn't necessarily know if we would find phosphine gas. So can you explain a little about why you would look for something that you wouldn't even know if you were to find it in the end anyway. Yeah, it was just a curiosity thing really, really. and I realised we didn't have to wait for these space telescopes as one of phosphine's um, transitions, wavelengths at which it absorbs um, around one millimetre that we could do it with telescopes we already had on the surface of the Earth. So this was just really intriguing to me, partly as a technical idea to go, we could do this, and I think we could look for the amounts of molecules that, um, if you had a lot of microbes in the clouds of Venus, it would be a, a somewhat sensible experiment. So I thought um, it's worth getting even this like limit when we don't detect it to say we can rule out that um, that there's a really dense layer, really packed with microbes or something like that. So as you know, when we put in a proposal to use a telescope, you've got to say this is get got going to produce some number that is like sensible and of some interest to other people so that's where we were coming from right yeah and i i just kind of want to reiterate that the first observation um of phosphine gas was taken by the james clerk maxwell telescope in hawaii um and the instrument i mean it, it was a very difficult observation to yes. do. um so the instrument had one pixel yeah um and if we i mean if if you really think about that that's incredible you think about uh, a mobile phone with a camera that will have millions of pixels. So, and this instrument had one pixel. Yeah, we just kind of had Venus floating in the middle of one pixel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and and when I think one of the astonishing things was when I first saw the data. I think you sat sat me down and we were looking through the data. Um, it was, I mean. It was nearly, I, I imagined that this was going to be an impossible observation, that finding the signal in the noise of this data was like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so kind of, I think it was your determination really that to, to keep searching for, for the signature of the gas that, that it's the reason why um, the study would, finally came together. So um, what kind of made you keep searching uh, the data for the signal? I think it's just curiosity and um, I'm kind of reluctant to give up because I remember you and I looked at it and you had all this experience with data from this instrument and looking at complex things from young stars for example and we were really like oh <laughs> how are we going to dig something out and so I kind of put it aside for about a year after you and I thought well this is maybe not a high priority anymore because we can't figure out what to do with it. And then they very kindly invited me to do three months of um, research as a guest down at Cambridge University. Um, and then I had the time um, just to chat to people and you know get a kind of excitement for science going and had some time to spend on things. And I just thought, oh, well, let's take one final look before we really decide, you know, there's nothing worth telling anybody about. And then I realised... Um, if you process the data really, really carefully, like every two minutes of data was processed individually, um, and we had like 140 of those spectra, and actually something was coming out. Yeah, which is really amazing. And I mean, it, it's it's great that, that you obviously um, had that curiosity and the determination to really and find the time, that same. I think, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Don't get that. And then we were able to um, kind of confirm that observation uh, with an independent telescope, yep. so the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA for short, and this telescope is in one of the driest places on the Earth, so in, in the Atacama Desert in Chile as well. Um, so now that there are these two observations of phosphine gas in Venus's atmosphere, what do you think the next step is in, in the study, really? 
Um, so we're trying to do some more with phosphine. So if we can observe um, different transitions of the molecule at different wavelengths, perhaps in the infrared as well as the radio, it may tell us more. So um, we'd like the signal to be originating from the height where we think the temperatures are suitable for life. And the more observations, we can track that down better. But these are all likely to be equally difficult. So thinking a bit longer term, I think we really need to send some kind of... Um, uh, spacecraft, maybe in the small space probe dropped off by a larger spacecraft with another mission, Some, just something to go there and make the observations like right close up, or maybe even take a physical sample of gas in the atmosphere. So in order to confirm if it is life that's producing the phosphine gas, you think we're going to need to send a spacecraft to Venus then? To I think we will, um, to be unambiguous, um, which we've done our best with the calculations to show it's not some natural non-life mechanism on Venus. So we've ruled out all kinds of things like volcanoes and lightning and meteors and sunlight and all sorts of things. Um, but some information anyway is missing about Venus, so um, next generation spacecraft that are going are going to tell us a lot more. But I think if we could send some kind of lab on a chip technology that people use on Earth, for example, to sample toxic gas, see if life can survive in um, you know, nasty environments like you know, when you've had a volcanic eruption, for example, you want to measure the gas, see what toxic gases are coming out um, of a volcano to protect people um, who might live nearby. If we could adapt some of that kind of technology to do just a one-off experiment, even if we could drop it into or through the clouds of Venus and get any kind of signal back, I think that'd be really exciting. Right. And so lastly, um, and this is a question that we're asked all the time at the Royal Observatory, um, the public's very interested in this, and I think it's a question that every astronomer will answer differently. So, do you think that there's alien life out there, either in the atmosphere of Venus or further afield as well, so in our galaxy or in other galaxies too? I think we might look back even in 10 years and go, it was a really strange belief that it could only happen on Earth, because we found life in all these crazy places on Earth bottom of the sea, for example, that people in the 1970s equally thought that was hostile. So I'm not going to be very surprised if in 10 years we can say there's like several habitats we think there's a really good chance of simple life. I think um, the path of life to become um, more organised and complex is one of the things we understand much less well. So um, I'm much less sure about whether um, there's large life forms and communicating life anywhere close to us in the galaxy. I think that's very much... Um, the next open question. Yeah, and I think if, if we can find life in uh, an environment as harsh as Venus, we could also find life where, you know, we find liquid water in the solar yeah. system as well, like on the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. As you mentioned, and, something yeah. we worked on and that was great fun together. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, thank you very much uh, for thank coming you. to talk to us uh, today, Jane, and um, hopefully we'll have you back in the upcoming years with an update on the study and maybe Love even to. a confirmation of life as well. That would so. be wonderful. Look oh, yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.